Hey, welcome to Everything Money. We're very excited to bring you a four-part series in interviews that we conducted with famous investor Monish Babrai in Austin, Texas. In this first video, we talked to Manish about building his business from the ground up. You're going to hear how he ran this business like an investor and what it did for him. Again, this is a four-part series, so stay tuned for more videos. But first, Monish Babrai. Well, uh, Seth, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, welcome to Austin. The cloudy um, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's really pretty. It is. foggy, but it's foggy I think, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I, uh, I like the place more and more, and I hope you get to enjoy some of the food. Oh, we, we certainly have. So, um, so anyway, I, I wanted to talk, Manish, I had, I did not know you at all, uh, earlier this, earlier this year until I read, uh, your friend, William Green's great book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. And we have been preaching this book is like one of the first reads you should do if you're interested in value investing. And uh, so I, we, our viewers know your upbringing in India and where you at now, but Paul, you wanted to get right into a question that you're dying to ask. So my company is a Crossroads group and we have eight or nine businesses in there. And then we also invest. So you had a very successful sale of a software business that you started from scratch, correct? Mm -hmm. And a consulting business. Yeah. And I believe I read you had credit card debt when you started it. So that's a different trend. Everybody knows you as the investor. The entrepreneur side of you, you know, taking on, how much was it in credit card debt? I heard 70,000? Yeah, about 70,000, yeah. So, you know, why'd you start the company? What was it? And how'd you lead to an exit? Yeah, well, uh, you know, the, the, the impetus to start the company was that I was about 25 years old at the time. And I had, I had enjoyed working at the employer I was with. Yeah. Uh, but but they had grown a lot and it was getting more bureaucratic. And I felt like I had, uh, you could say, one free shot. I felt like I could take uh, one flyer and if that flyer didn't work, I could go back to sedate corporate life. Yeah. But But I felt like I was single. There was no kids. There was no wife. And in a few years, that would change, mm -hmm. right? So... So I, I, I had an idea of a business and I had no money. And uh, so I first emptied out my 401k, which was 30,000. And at 25, I wasn't too worried about my retirement yeah. savings. Do you have any guidance? Did anyone tell you not to do that? Uh, no, actually, uh, my dad was encouraging me to do it. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think I, uh, I, I heard from anyone not to do it. And actually, uh, and this is the part which is, I think uh, dovetails with investing is uh, a common, um, I would say common uh, misnomer for entrepreneurs is that people think that entrepreneurs are risk takers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, entrepreneurs do not take risk. And so take a step back. We want to separate startups into two categories, venture backed startups and non venture backed startups. Venture backed startups make up less than one tenth of one percent of startups. Mm -hmm. They are an anomaly and they are minuscule and they can be ignored. So even though they get a lot of press, 99.99% of startups are non venture backed. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about here. The venture backed startups are a different animal. We'll get to that hopefully later. So, but, but non venture backed startups would be like the Chinese restaurant the laundromat, right. you know, the, the gas station, you know. So these are, there are more than a million businesses that get formed in the U.S. every year. And almost all of them get no venture backing. They are financed by friends, families, and fools. <laughs> you know, that's how they get financed. Right. And credit cards. Uh, so Visa and MasterCard were my venture capitalists and they were great VCs. <laughs> they never took a board seat and they never told me what to do. Life is great. And what interest were you paying? That was 1990? The, this was, uh, yeah, 90, 91. Uh, I think the average was about 18%. Okay. And uh, so, uh, so basically, uh, I had researched uh, personal bankruptcy law before I started and they've changed those laws now. But at that time, the laws were that if I had a bunch of credit card debt and other debt that I had no ability to repay, I could basically file bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy, and they would cleanse the record because they just look and say, okay, where are your assets and liabilities? And it's done, right? 
and then you couldn't refile for seven years. So what happened is that credit card companies and lenders thought you were a better credit risk after you declared personal bankruptcy than before because they couldn't get screwed again. For then, seven more years. For seven mm-hmm. more years, right? So they know that for seven years you can't refile. And uh, so actually they're very willing to lend to you after that. So my, my thinking was, okay, I have a job, I have skills, I can leave my job and I can take this flyer. And if this flyer doesn't work, I can find another job. Now, I did a couple more things to put uh, even more risk into the equation. Added a, a few more layers of protection uh, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, curbing risk. One of those things was that, and I tell this to everyone, is I did not just quit my job and start the business. Mm-hmm. I started the business while I was working. And, and I've always told people, look, there's 168 hours in a week. Your employer needs 40 hours. You still have 128 hours left. Mm -hmm. And even after you take out hours for eating and sleeping and all of that, you have at least another 40 hours. If you don't spend it on commuting and that sort of thing, you basically everyone, if they had no hobbies and, you know, going to bars or whatever else, they have a good 40 hours they could dedicate to a second enterprise. So my objective was to work on my business while someone was else was paying the rent. And once the business had traction, that's when I would quit. So when you start businesses, yes, they have risk because you don't have customers, you don't have revenue, no expenses. I cut all of that, right? Because I'm, I'm getting paid by somebody else and I didn't really have much of a burn rate. And so I did both my business and my job for about 10 months. And what happened after about eight or nine months is I had the first client and I had cash flow coming in. And another month, month and a half after that, I had two more clients. And these were significant amounts of revenue. You know, each client was north of 100, 150,000 of consulting revenue. So there were big chunks of uh, money coming in. And because I had no office, no employees, I didn't need a salary because someone else was paying me. There wasn't much in expense, right? And uh, so basically, once I had the third client and I could see that for the next few months, we would be cash flow positive. Okay. And I was dying to go full time because I was working. I used to wake up at six or seven in the morning, work till eight or nine. Then I'd come back at five or six then work till midnight and then work weekends. And I was just dying to go full time just my business. And uh, the other thing I did was that I was always a model employee. And when I started my business, I decided there is no need to be a model employee. The objective is to be slightly above (laughs) the level at which you would get fired. (laughs) So figure out at which point they would say, we need to can the guy. I've seen you that line and got fired. And be slightly above that. (laughs) Make sure you're not slightly below that. Make sure you're slightly above that. Do you mind sharing who you're working for? Yeah, so I was working for a company in Chicago at the time called Tel Labs. Okay. And they've been acquired now. And mm-hmm. so, but they were a public company, about 2,000 employees. And uh, so it's funny, you know, when I, when I went in to resign to my boss and his boss, and I told them I was starting a <clears throat> business, I'd already started it, was, and it was not competitive with them and all that. So they said, uh, they said, you know, Monish, the last 10 months, we were completely confused because we, we saw that somehow you had turned off. <laughs> And you were not the old guy who was just killing it. He said, but you know, we discussed it and we repeatedly said, it's not so bad that we want to fire him. <laughs> you okay. did it. <laughs> I said, Michael, that was exactly the point. I was trying to stay just above the, he said, yeah, we discussed it a few times and we said, yeah, you know, he's above average and we can't really fire him, but it's, we don't know what's going on. And then they said to me, when your startup fails, not if your startup fails. They said to me, listen, Monish, when your startup fails, you have a promotion. Oh my God. You have a job. You can come back anytime and you've got more pay. So I said, this is better than my plan, which was that <laughs> I go bankrupt and I start looking for work. Right. I got not, I, I'm getting more money than I was going to make earlier. It was great. So, uh, so, you know, like, you know, it tastes great and it's less filling. Yes. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, when I quit, 
it was even better than I thought. Uh, and I had a lot of goodwill with my employer. They were well-wishers. And uh, so actually the risk profile when I quit my job, we had clients. This is a recurring revenue business. So if you don't piss off your clients, they'll keep coming back. And I knew that there was so much in the pipeline that I had worked on in the last eight or 10 months that they would start popping. You know, the first three had popped, but there were a lot more that were going to pop once I went full time. And so then I never looked back. Where did you get this inner confidence? Sorry, Paul. I mean, where, okay. you know, I, I, we have a lot of people starting businesses and it seems like scary to do these steps that you, that you sound so confident in. Was it that safety net that you had to move forward? Or did you, like I said, uh, or, or did you have some guidance from yeah, someone? Yeah, was it in the family? You? Was, did your father? Yeah, my, my dad was an entrepreneur okay. throughout his life. And I'd watched, I'd watched my father numerous times go bankrupt, Just start fail. from zero, you know, get going. But I would say a couple of things that uh, people seem to forget in the U.S., you know. Uh, my father-in-law used to tell me that the U.S. is the only country where the poor people are fat, okay? When you go to the rest of the world, the poor people do not get enough calories. They are thin and they are malnourished. This is a country where the poor are getting too much food, too much calories. Basically, that's because there is a very strong safety net in the U.S. So I tell, I tell my friends that, listen, uh, the odds that you would starve I'm if you well. quit your job and started a business or the odds that you would be <laughs> homeless are so minuscule. You know, most of our, we, we have a homeless problem in this country, <clears throat> but most of it is a mental health problem. Mm -hmm. It's a mental health and an addiction and a substance abuse problem for the most part. There are still people who get homeless because of economic circumstances, but we've, it's a complicated issue. But, but the safety nets in the U.S. are very significant. I mean, there's food stamps, you know, you've got unemployment insurance, you've got welfare, uh, you've got Medicaid. So there, there's a lot of programs and then you've got a lot of charities and so on. So the odds that you would fall through all of those, be somewhere destitute and be losing weight is not what the experience in the yes. U.S. is. Yeah, yeah. What would be happening when you went through all of that is you'd be putting on weight. Hmm. You would have too many calories and you're drinking too many Cokes. Yes. Mm. I do on Coke. Of course, Mine's yes. Coke Zero. Oh, yeah, that's better. So you're yeah. okay. <laughs> so, um, so tell me about your business you started. It was a consulting business. So what was your, hey, I'm going to go do this. I mean, I'm working. You said, that it, you said it wasn't a competitor to Tell Labs. So yeah. What was the business? And then how'd you start with, did you pick up the phone and start dialing for dollars? Like what was your way of getting clients? Yeah. So basically, uh, basically all businesses are in one way or another doing arbitrage. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. They, when people start businesses when someone starts a Chinese restaurant, the first thing they think about is how many Chinese restaurants are in this zip code? Mm -hmm. How, who's, who am I going to compete with? They won't be so concerned about the pizza places around but they'd be very concerned about other Chinese places around, right? And if you, if you go into a town where there's no Chinese restaurants, well, the odds are you, if you know how to cook and how to service people, you might make it. Yeah. Because now you're, it's an arbitrage game. So when I started my IT business at that time for my employer, I had been running, uh, one of the things I was doing for them is I was running a, a joint venture project in India between them and a company in India, where we had moved some of the R&D to India. And it was a lot cheaper. I mean, we'd, we'd cut costs by like 90%. And the quality of the engineers in India was exceptional. So I used to go pop into India every few months and I was overseeing the JV. And I just saw that this has enormous potential. This was before all the outsourcing, everything had happened. They would, they would have been like four American companies in Bangalore at the time, like almost nothing. And I came back and I told my employer, tell that, I told my boss, listen, we need to do a 10x on this. Okay, we've, we've got like, uh, we had sent one engineer over and we had like a team of about 10 people. I said, it needs to go to 100. I said, this is such a no brainer. We can get, we have a bunch of projects we can't get to here because it's expensive or we don't have engineering uses. So let's go, let's do this. And there was so much, you know, turf protection and bureaucracy and, you know, not, not made my backyard, whatever else, uh, that they weren't interested. So I said, well, if these idiots don't want to deal with this, 
uh, why don't I do this as a business for businesses? Because I could see that American companies wanting to leverage this, they would be missing so many pieces. Now it's a lot easier, right? Because we have the internet right. and we have all this uh, global companies, you know, Microsoft's got big, big operations, India, Google, all of them, right? But at that time, there was nothing. There was only Texas Instruments and maybe there was uh, AT&T, one or two other companies. And that was it. And so I felt like it was a big, big field and uh, I could do well. And the other lesson in startups, uh, which is very important to keep in mind, is whatever idea you have for your startup, you know, or arbitrage you're going to play, is going to be wrong. Okay, so whatever you, again. whatever going to idea wrong. you come up with for your business and you get going, that idea is going to be wrong. Sound familiar? Okay, okay. Yeah. Because, because you came up with it in an ivory tower right. in a room by yourself with no relevance to the real world. Okay, so the very important thing. So I'll give you, a, I'll take a, a, you know, detour for a second and come back. There's a, there's a friend of mine, uh, Viresh Bhatia, great, great guy, great entrepreneur. And uh, Viresh was the founder of a company called Install Shield. So you guys may remember, maybe you're too young, but whenever you have to uh, install any product on Windows, there's a utility which pops up. It says Install yep. Shield. And Install Shield basically is a tool all software companies used eventually to install their product on Windows. Okay, they had like 98% market share. Wow. And Viresh came up with it, okay? So Viresh was in the 80s, you know, he was a computer science undergrad student at Northwestern in Chicago. And he was always like a hacker dabbling on different things. And he was trying to do like Google Maps, okay, in 1980 when the, 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 the memory and the software and the processors could not support it, right? So he was just way ahead of his time. So he kept trying to build all these different things. He had great ideas, but they wouldn't work. So one time he was at a trade show and he was going to kind of show his tools, you know, the different software tools he developed to sell to people. And he had seven tools. So when he, when he created like the backdrop for the, for the, um, for the trade show, he had like four tools on one side and three on the other, and it wasn't symmetrical. And that was bothering him. You know, like your eight pillars you just yeah, talked about, yeah. right? It was bothering him. He wanted it to be eight. He didn't want it to be seven. So an after afterthought, he put number eight, uh, you know, um, install tool for Windows. And he called <laughs> it install sheet. It, was a, it didn't even exist. It was just a concept in his head. Okay. And for three days, there was a guy who was across the aisle from him, also a software guy, looking at his wall for three days. And then after three days, he comes and talks to him and say, I'm interested in that tool number eight. Huh. So Vire said, why? You don't have an interest in the other seven? He said, no, I just want number <laughs> eight. So he says, okay, uh, I can get you number eight in about a month or month and a half. He says, yeah, I'd love to have number eight because I think that's, that's really a problem for me because when I'm building my thing to install on Windows. And so the only product he had that got traction eventually was number eight. The other seven went by the wayside. And why did he get traction? Because the customer pushed him. Okay, it's not something he came up with. He himself came up with these seven things that he himself developed, they never went anywhere. And so when I, when I started my company, I had a slide deck, okay, which said, this is what we do. <laughs> and I, I remember I went to, there was a company called uh, First Chicago. Uh, it's a huge bank in Chicago. Jamie Dimon eventually became the, the CEO of that bank much later. And now it's part of JP Morgan. But First Chicago was a big bank in Chicago. And I had gone to present to their CIO, what we could do for them, et cetera. And I remember I'm in the presentation and I'm going through my slides and uh, the, the CIO says to me, wait, go back to the previous slide. 
So I went back to the previous slide again, explained it, and again went forward. He said, "Wait, don't ever change the previous slide. I want the rest of this time only on that slide." So I said, "You know, I like thirty slides." I said, "You want to see?" He said, "I don't have any interest. Just please do not hit next." <laughs> okay, he wow. said. He said, "Stick to that slide." So I had just uh, in that slide, I had a just a one sentence comment. that what had happened in india was that in the 1970s they were they had gone through a nationalization program where they told coke give us your formula or leave the country and coke said we're leaving the country mm-hmm. okay and so they kicked out a lot of multinationals like ibm was told share all your technology with us or the indian market's not open to you so ibm left coke left a lot of companies left right but there was a large install base of ibm mainframes in india and suddenly there was no no one to service them and you couldn't get a new ibm mainframe ibm stopped selling to india so indian companies were forced before any other places in the world to go into client server computing they were forced to use mini computers uh which the rest of the world went to 10 15 years later you know how we went from computing from mainframe to mid range to just small servers that whole transition uh, which now then eventually went to the cloud india was ahead because they had no choice so if you're a large indian company you couldn't get an ibm mainframe so you had to run your it systems on these distributed small boxes and the us at that time in the 1990s was just getting into the client server computing So I had just a remark that India is ahead on client server computing and that's all that this guy wanted to talk about so I explained to him all this nuance of IBM being kicked out and this and that he said um, you have expertise in India on oracle database on a small computer I said we have a lot of that because that's all that the guys are running on he said I'm not sending my systems to India for development. I want those Oracle developers that you have in India on my site here. Because the problem I realized was that Oracle was growing really fast in the 1990s. Every time they sold software, you needed an army of consultants to go in to implement it. And that army of consultants did not exist because nobody had the skills. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like suddenly you have a new industry it takes while for the skills to come up but india because it was of this quirk it had a large number of trains so he said i'm not interested in sending my critical banking systems to india someone hacks it but i want those guys on site so he said can you get me six oracle developers in two weeks i said i can get them to you in one week mm-hmm. okay and he said because what was happening with him is he was working with oracle corporation which didn't have the time or the people and oracle corporation was charging like 3000 dollars a day per person plus expenses and nobody wanted to come to chicago in the winter okay even at 3000 dollars a day right my indian engineers they didn't know what chicago is and until they were here <laughs> they didn't know what snow is mm-hmm. you know and so that's when i realized that i have to change the model And what was the cost versus 3000 a day? We were at like I mean anything above 300 a day I was making money. Huh. Oh. So if I priced it at 500 a day we yeah. were making 200 dollars a day per person. Per person. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah and 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 so we you know and actually I realized in hindsight I severely underpriced mm-hmm. because I didn't understand. Right. I didn't understand what they were paying but later I got smart you know so the first couple of deals they were like where do i sign <laughs> okay <laughs> but after that we got we got smart and we also the the cost started going up uh, for us as well but what i'm trying to say is that with viresh and with me it wasn't what we came up with once once he stopped me on that slide and i finished that meeting i went back i deleted the entire deck except that slide and i made that slide 20 slides mm. okay and then when i went for meetings <clears throat> the it was like cake walk mm-hmm. right because now it was a very honed message and so i think there are there are these so i think when you when you start a business um 
there's a great book which is called the origin and evolution of new businesses it was written by a guy named uh, amar bide he was a uh, he was a professor at harvard and amar is now a good friend of mine i got to know him uh, afterwards and he he interviewed 10 years of inc 500 ceos and basically asked all these people because they had all been successful he asked them you know different aspects of their journey and like things like what i just talked about which is so one thing that i did which i did on a vacuum i didn't even know this i had two business cards okay i had two different kinds of business card one business card said president and ceo i never used that card okay the other business card said vice president marketing that was the card i used so when i went to meet these companies i did not present myself as the owner of the business i presented myself as i am the head of the marketing and sales team okay so it made the company look bigger right because and and what would happen is that i i remember marty marty brown street at, at first chicago he looks at me he sees a guy who's pretty smart and impressive but he's not an entrepreneur so he says the company must be really good to hire a guy like this right so it makes the company look bigger yeah, most people yeah. do the opposite. and and yeah, and, and they did a they number of things so a lot of them put international in their names they put global in their names because all these things made it look bigger mm-hmm. right so you had a blowfish kind of um, mentality amongst entrepreneurs but it was not that they spoke to each other and came up with it they what amar found is that all these people were doing the same thing without really knowing that this was actually the path and so in his book he basically laid out a framework he said look you can go try to stumble around in the dark and figure it out and half of it you'll figure out half of it won't but here are the things you need to think about and here are the things you need to think about like So there was a, a lot like value investing by the way. Oh yeah. Wouldn't you say like I, I you know it's funny a lot of people said to me, "Oh you sound like this person this person." Have you read them? Like I have no idea who that is, but it's just the value investors all speak a certain way. Yeah. You just all stumble upon it in a different way. Anyways, yeah, I mean basically it's you know you're putting money out today and you're hoping to get more back tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And how much you get back and how long it takes, that's the name of the game. Right? Right? And so Uh, like i mean uh, one of the things like uh, amar found like one of the guys he interviewed was this guy who was a college dropout he was a he had been a tech in the army for a couple of years and then he had enough of the us army he quit and um, he was living in a, like a studio apartment in florida and his printer was in one end of the studio and his computer was at the other end of the studio went to the store to get a cable which was long enough oh connect, yeah i've heard this right yeah, story yeah heard and mm-hmm. they didn't have the cable they said look in daisy chain these like four cables and it would cost like 150 bucks so he said i don't daisy chain these things and so he said um, do people come and ask for cables of different lengths he said all the time he says uh, and he had been a tech in army making cables yeah okay he said what if i made these cables and gave them to you he said look man you don't have a brand one he said what if i gave it to you on consignment he said you mean just put it in my store and when i sell them you get paid he said yeah put them in my store i don't care right it's on consignment First. so what he did is at that time there was all these computers they had their own interfaces there was no usb and all these standard interfaces that we have now each printer manufacturer had its own plug each computer manufacturer has its own plug so to plug these things in it was like a you know you know this whole matrix of cables you needed so he made the matrix found all the lengths that were missing and found the ones that were popular and produced them and then he just went up and down the coast of florida to all these different computer shops and did the same deal with them because the first guy when he told him consignment and and he had super normal profits you know Fifteen dollar cost, fifty dollar selling price, right? And so, but the thing is that the shelf life of those products was very short because three months, six months, then the manufacturer would come Changing. out with a longer length. But he kept he kept finding out which computers are coming out, which is the next one. So he was like riding the wave, just a little bit ahead of the bureaucratic manufacturers. And eventually, the company became several thousand employees. <clears throat> because they found a niche in services so they became a cable installer for large companies 
and so the cable business went away and they became a services company and they really scaled so it was just pure arbitrage so that's the example of just pure arbitrage you talk about this in your book that arbitrage has a timing yes. you know, you're on a, a fuse yes. you know, when how did the business progress when did other businesses catch up and how did you what move towards selling yeah so it? i think what all entrepreneurs do who end up surviving is they are riding waves so i knew that the oracle wave that i was riding in 1992 by the time it was 94 or 95 it was starting to mature there was more and more competition that had come in there were more people trained you couldn't get the same margins so then i had to move to the next the next one which was what's the new kid on the block you know and we then switched to people soft which was another very rich vein for a while then we switched to business objects which was another way in for a while so i had to continuously keep and and uh, just like the cable guy was doing and and what happens is that sometimes what happens when you're when you're doing these things you hit upon something which becomes stable so sometimes what happens is when you when you're riding these curves like the cable guy he found services and then that just scaled nicely forever um you you run into things that actually end up working and then then you're fine you know and and uh, then suddenly the business becomes sustainable and what what um what what led to selling it um was this somebody appro- i mean you sold in 2000 which was the peak of the tech was it somebody approaching you did you and if you don't mind me asking like what you you sold the business for 6 million what were your revenues what were your profits what were your debts like you know what did you have to pay off etc because i'm interested to hear based on 2000 how the whole process how many people do you have working for you everything yeah so actually my uh, my problem was that by 98 or 99 the company had close to 200 people wow, wow. okay it had I did a, not expect you to say it that. was a it, it was a good size operation that we were running and the thing is that i'm kind of like a a game player mm-hmm. okay i love to play games to me the startup was a lot of fun when i had things to figure out like when marty says to me just stick to that slide and then i had to think about it and you know rearchitect the business and all of that those were exciting things right what what happened is my job changed to managing a bunch of egos okay uh-huh. i now have these 200 people i have a bunch of vice presidents they're finding turf wars there's all the politics and i hated all of it now there's a lot of other people who are really good at management and they love it but i didn't like it and so i was i was you know finding it that that when i was going to work it was a grind it wasn't and and what has happened a few years before that 94 95 is i heard about warren buffett and charlie munger right and i started reading up on them and i was really intrigued with his model and his approach and how it dovetailed with the same nuances that I was using in entrepreneurship so i started to apply his principle for value investing on my own portfolio and what was happening is that we were we were facing a lot of tough times in 97 98 um where the business was having difficulties but the investment portfolio was doing great and i was finding that one guy me alone working 15 hours a week is making more money than the company with 100 people mm-hmm. because the 100 people was you know 10 of your people are not working or 15 people are not working that just eats all your margin so you really had to be everyone had to be cranking and if you didn't have the billing going on it would just eat you alive and so there was this whole problem where we were some areas of business were doing well some were not doing so well those people are sitting there doing nothing and i was just struggling through all of that and then on the on the investing side i'm making like 70 80% a year and i'm looking at myself saying i don't have the hr problems right. i don't have people problems i make more money here uh why do i have this business that i hate how big was your portfolio then oh, sorry man okay. we started i started with a million dollars i had sold a small portion of the business in 94 i was i was i had about a million and by the time we got to 99 2000 it was about 13 14 million oh wow yeah so and i had no money before then right i started with credit cards 
when I sold a portion of the business in 94, is the first time I had a million dollars sitting in the bank. Till then, it was like, you know, lines of credit and all this stuff where I had debt. I, I couldn't see the cash because the company was growing so fast. And this was the first time in 94 that I had the cash. And then that cash sitting separately away from the business had grown a lot. And by 98, 99, when it was sitting at like north of 10, 12, 13 million, I felt, okay, I am financially independent now. And why do I need to deal with all these, all the cat herding business? <laughs> you know, I don't want to be in the cat herding business. So that's when I said, I really don't want to go to work. I really don't like, it was very strange because normally if I don't like the place I'm working, I just resign. Mm -hmm. There was no one to resign to. And so that's when um, my, I was part of a group called YPO and oh, I was yeah. in a forum and they told me, listen, you can own the business without running it. I said, why didn't I think of that? You know? And so in 99, I started a search for a CEO. And uh, about six months after that, uh, I got a guy from Texas Instruments uh, who came on board. Uh, not, not Texas Instruments, sorry, EDS, um, Dallas company, uh, Rossboro. Yeah. And uh, so he came on board and then I was done. Now I still own the business, but I was no longer managing it. And then literally a month after he, after he started, he called me and said, someone wants to buy it. I said, now he had relocated from Dallas and all that. So I said, I don't want to pull the rug out from under you. I said, what do you want to do? He said, sell it. Because what was going to happen is all his options would trigger right away right. after doing one month of work. And the buyer wanted him to keep running it. So he would get a new deal. So he was going to double dip. So from his point of view, it was a no-brainer, sell it. He gets to cash out and then he gets to again run and build the, pl build the place. So that's what we did. So what happened is that in uh, 99, I left the business. I really said, fine, I'll own it, whatever. But then the deal happened and I got cashed out. That's great. It's fine. So while you were, you were investing at the time, what, and you had not discovered Munger and Buffett yet. I had. Yeah, you yeah. had. In 94. And I is had. that when, you, well, I mean, you were getting phenomenal returns. What yeah. were you, what were you, were you implementing? Is that when you kind of started your cloning strategy? Yeah. I mean, uh, not, uh, I wasn't doing so much cloning then. I think what I had, uh, what I had, uh, you know, there were a couple of very interesting things that I had figured out, which were, which were kind of fun. One of the things was that I, I had a lot of expertise in software and especially in business software and especially business software that needed a lot of customization because that was the business we were in. And I, I, I was looking at these companies and, and their valuations were really high. So yeah. like I, I remember I looked at a company called PeopleSoft and it was trading at a hundred times earnings. Okay. And I said, the, if the market is right, that the 100 times earnings is justified, it means it's going to grow a lot in the future. That's the only reason right. of course, that, right. that multiple makes sense. Right. And if PeopleSoft is going to grow a lot in the future, the services piece of that is just massive. It's, it's, it, because I'd seen what happened to Oracle. So I said, I cannot buy a company at 100 times earnings. But what I can do is I can... I used the PE of 100 to decide which businesses I was going to focus the services end of my business on. So I looked at the, the companies that had the highest market caps, highest PE ratios, and I said, that's the ones I am going to put a focus on. Right now, the problem was I had no expertise. Like PeopleSoft, like I can barely spell PeopleSoft, <laughs> right? How am I going to sell anything to anyone who wants PeopleSoft? I have no expertise. So what I did is I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put a quarter million dollars at risk and I'm going to hire a practice leader for people. So pay the guy a quarter million and doesn't matter if he comes and sits on a desk and does nothing, but we're going to, I'm going to use him to get the business going. So I, I put an ad out and whatever to looking for people, so practice leader and within a few weeks I had hired a guy uh, Paul Yates and I hired him for about I think 250 or 300,000 he wanted a guarantee no matter what happened he got paid right? right so I said fine that's fine Paul I made an offer letter for him and I sent it to him he signed it and he was going to join in about three weeks right and about a week before he was going to join he says you know 
the company I'm at right now, the, where he was doing the consulting, their project will fall flat if I leave. I mean, he was leading a 20-person team there. So he said, they don't want me to leave. So I said, do they want us to bill you out to them? He said, yeah. They're, they're, they're asking if you will please bill me out to them. I said, what are they going to pay? He says about uh, uh, $400 an hour. That's a good spread. Okay. Yeah, so about, it'd be about $800,000 a year. For, I said, Paul, tell them yes. Okay, tell them you, I don't want to disrupt anything. $400 an hour. Uh, you can go work for them. No problem. So he didn't even spend an hour on the bench or anything. Literally, my only expense to get him was like $300 on an ad or something. Okay. And maybe five bucks for the letterhead and printing <laughs> it or whatever. Right. Then after another four days, he calls me and says, the client needs about eight more guys on the project. And he's asking if we can provide the, the team. So I said, Paul, uh, because he was the head of the PeopleSoft user group in Chicago. I said, Paul, uh, do you know guys? He said, yeah, I know eight people we can bring on right away. I said, bring them on. Okay. I said, what are they going to pay? He says, for them, they'll pay about 300 an hour. I said, what are they going to cost us? He said, like 150, 200 k a year. I said, hire them all. Okay. So now I had those eight guys with the spread. I haven't even seen Paul after the interview, okay? <laughs> right? And that business, that business was cranking massive cash flow for us, right? So I used my investing side on the business side and it was just great. So I was just toggling back. Sometimes I would buy the stock, but sometimes I'd go build the practice, right? And so, and the build practice, I mean, that was just great. Well, that's interesting because, you know, with our eight or nine businesses, I... We run them in a way of like, okay, how are we allocating our capital, right? Because a good, yeah. you know, a good CEO is going to be one who can allocate yeah. capital, which is a very unknown thing in the world, right? Yeah. Most CEOs, they think, oh, it's a marketing and salesperson. It's like, no, CEO needs to be able to allocate the capital properly. And when I started looking at our businesses, the way I look at our you know, investments of a company, yeah. it makes perfect sense to me, right? The people's of practice that we did took less than $1,000 of capital. <laughs> and you made okay. That's awesome. $4 million in cash flow. Okay. <laughs> When I started Pabrai Funds, it took less than a thousand dollars of capital. Okay. And there have been years in Pabrai Funds where my fees have been 20 million. Okay. It's never taken after the first 1,000, it's never taken any more capital. So, because you can see the, the, the would they, you consider that a good return on investment? <laughs> I think it's acceptable. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. We can, we can live with it. The reason we created the software was exactly for this. Because people watch the videos, want to do their own analysis when they see me do this. So we created the software so people could do this. You get everything you see here on the Everything Money channel, on the Everything Money page, all our tools, plus all the ones coming up. You get over 30 years of financial data. You get access to Seth Mo and I. You get all the eight pillar analysis, that stock analyzer tool, real estate calculator, retirement calculator, eight pillar portfolio. We can put in 50 stocks at once and it tells you how they all look as a portfolio. All of this plus exclusive daily content. We have one, two, three videos a day that we release only to our users of our software. You get it all in mobile form. All of this is available on your mobile app, all for only 90 cents per day. 90 cents per day, if you can increase your returns or decrease your losses by one or 2% a year, that could lead to hundreds of thousands, probably even millions of dollars in extra net worth for only 90 cents a day. Two ways to sign up, everythingmoney.com or Patreon. The benefit of everythingmoney.com directly is you don't pay sales tax yet because we're not big enough. So sign up, only 90 cents a day. This is a no-brainer, less than a cup of coffee.